Hi, this is Jamie Machek with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. We apologize if you were unable to view this webinar live. If you have a question for Pat, you can email her at the address found on the bottom of this screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, The Ethics of Library Customer Service, Fair Treatment for Everybody. I'm Jamie Machek, the Education Consultant for the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. And thank you to the Northern Waters Library Service and the Southwest Wisconsin Library System for also supporting this webinar. This is the first of three customer service webinars in this series. So we thank you for being here today. We have Pat Wagner with us today, and many of you have probably heard her speak before. If you haven't, um, you're in for a real treat. And she has been doing library consulting for a long time, many years, and has done many presentations for libraries in Wisconsin. So Pat, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you folks for joining us today. Uh, yes, many years in Wisconsin, and I have to say that the topic of ethics and customer service and ethics is something I've worked with libraries for of all sizes for over 20 years, and I've heard a lot of stories and seen different issues, and one of the issues that comes up over and over again, even though I've taught this kind of class and facilitated it for large universities, academic, public, and so on, most of the people I work with are in small communities, and they often tell me, they said, well, it's well and good to talk about ethics and the limits we have on service and what we need to do in the public sector, but I live in a small town, and we're friendly, and we offer custom-friendly service. So what I tell people is, okay, just imagine that you just walked into your dentist's office or the bank or your doctor's office. And as you walk in, you hear the staff at the front desk gossiping out loud about what's going on with people in town, what their bank account is, uh, how their teeth are, their, their medical diagnoses. And then you come up to the front desk and they start saying, oh, Pat, so how's your psoriasis going, right? And there's 20 people in the lobby. Or you're up at your bank and they said, well, you know, Pat, you bounced three checks this week, right? And you know the town gossip is standing five feet away. And worse than that, what if you went up to a service desk, say, at your local county tax assessors or at some government office where you needed something that day, and you watched as the people in front of you were given special favors because their friend was clerking at the counter, and then you come up and they say, oh, no, ma'am, I'm sorry, that's against the rules. How would you feel? So what we're talking about is a kind of a professionalism that we have to pay attention to even in smaller communities, even with your friends. And what it does is it builds trust and respect for everybody. So there's some things that we call ethical challenges. And these are everyday things that happen in our encounters with people in the library. We're mostly gonna be talking about frontline customer service, people at the CERC desk, reference desk, people who are dealing with people over the phone. But the truth is, it's everybody. It's everybody that we deal with. So the first thing is, are there people in our community who are considered privileged and they get a better class of service? And the question I always ask people why they explain why they're doing special favors for different people, I said, well, if you can offer that for one person, why aren't there those same perks for everyone all the time? And the usual thing I hear is we don't have enough resources and so on. And I said, well, what would happen if you did? And it's interesting when people actually take it seriously, most of the time they said, well, you know, I guess we could offer it for everyone. Uh, one of the words or phrases that I hear all the time that kind of puts the hairs on the back of my neck up is when they tell someone to use their own judgment. And the problem is, and you can look at the language, judgment, unfortunately, is also similar to prejudice. And I've had people, and I've argued about this in classes, say, people have to earn my respect. And if that young person who comes to the counter is rude to me, they don't deserve my respect. Well, unfortunately, you decided to work for the public sector. And in the public sector, what we're doing is offering the same fair and equal treatment to everyone who walks in the door. People don't have to earn your trust and respect. You are just 
there to do your best to offer a consistent line of service to people. And so this idea that people have to earn, I tell people if that's your attitude, you should really not be at the customer service desk of a public sector agency. The third thing, and I sort of touched on this before, is that, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the ethics are, is that just because something feels like it's the good thing to do, it makes your heart warm, is it always the right thing to do? Now, yes, there's always exceptions, but let's talk about the center of the bell curve, okay? And what we're talking about is special treatment for friends and family and neighbors and people who look like you and talk like you and are of your same socioeconomic status. You know, I'm um, I'm senior now. I'm a senior now, and I have gray hair, and I'm a middle class, white, college-educated woman who's worked with libraries for over 40 years. I know the secret handshake. I know the jargon. In most libraries in the United States, I will get better service than a 14-year-old Hispanic boy, even if that young man asks for the same level of service, and that's not right. But the people who are giving me the extra service feel good about it because either I look like them or I look like a family member or I make them feel comfortable. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about ethics. And finally, a very interesting thing has to do with what we call ethical standards. Uh, in olden days, if you want to call it, and many of us were raised, regardless of what your age is, uh, we were supposed to defer to people who were older than us, who were women, people of higher status. It was considered good manners. In modern manners, we offer that to everyone. We treat everyone as a social equal. Whoever gets to the door first opens the door for the other person. If you're in a crowded bus, and somebody needs to sit down regardless of their age or gender, we let them sit down. We give them our seat. I mean, I'm always giving up my seat on those little shuttle buses that go between the airport and the hotels because sometimes there's someone who obviously needs it more than I do, so I stand up and I give it to them. It's, it's how it works. So we may think it's respectful behavior, um, to be able to do it if we define respect as deferring to people who have a higher status than we do, according to the old rules. But for other people, it simply looks like prejudice. Uh, I was at the Atlanta airport a couple years ago, picking up my car, and we're all standing in line, and it's a busy day, and there was a gentleman in front of me, younger than myself, and who happened to be African-American. And when we both came up to the counter, and he was in front of me, the woman um, called my name out first to wait on me. And I stopped and I said, oh, excuse me, this gentleman was ahead of me in line. And she looked appropriately embarrassed and he kind of shot me a grin and a thank you. And she waited on him and then waited on me. And then we all went outside to pick out our car and it happened again. He was standing in front of me in the line, and they came to me first. And I know that they were trying to be nice to me. I don't know. I, my mother looks like, used to say I look like living death when I get off an airplane. But nonetheless, he was in line first. So I try to tell people that respect isn't about giving special service. And these are the kind of challenges, everyday challenges we have, particularly in smaller communities when we're at a public service desk. So. If there are exceptions to the rule, if you want to call it that, these are exceptions that are created by the library as a whole, by your governing board, your leadership with input from staff and the stakeholders in the greater community. It's not up to you to decide who's going to get special service and who isn't. You can make recommendations. You can do the special service and say, you know, I see an opportunity for service here, but it's not just you deciding from your individual set of ethics. And that's where good people can collide in terms of ethical standards. The problem is when we start doing special favors for people, regardless of the reason, it starts to corrode the trust and respect that people have for us, just as if you were standing in line at that doctor's office or the pharmacy or any place else, and they um, were talking about you and offering other people special services that they weren't offering you. So we're going to talk about four main areas. We're going to talk a little bit about what library ethics are. We're going to talk about what we call the four ethical standards. Then we're going to talk about this issue of 
customer service standards, which means that even though we're just talking about what happens in interactions with customers at the front line, that's the, the main focus, what we do at the front line is really about what the whole library does. So I have some suggestions there. And then a little bit about first steps. And we'll be stopping in a few minutes and checking in with Jamie to see if there's any questions that come up that we can answer immediately. So what are library ethics? Um, what you can do is a thought exercise. And by the way, this is a really interesting exercise you can do with your trustees, um, governing board, regardless of what kind of uh, public library that you're with or private library. And obviously on staff days, if you're gonna hold, I, I have clients who are holding virtual staff days today. So think about what you think the word ethics means and then let's compare your answers. And I have to say up front that there are dozens of different ways to talk about ethics. I called a very educated friend of mine, Jim, who's brilliant polymath, meaning that he's an expert in a number of areas, anthropology and history and politics and the law. And I asked him, I said, tell me about ethics, Jim. Well, after about 10 minutes, I said, okay, stop. <laughs> because he started with, well, there's at least 50 different frameworks for talking about ethics. So we're gonna keep it real simple and vanilla today. What are ethics? Now, the difference between ethics and morality is morality is trying to figure out what right and wrong is. It's usually connected with religious and spiritual beliefs of some kind, but it, in ethics, we're talking about more than how you feel about something, it's also how you think. And, you know, morality might say, it's the right thing to help everyone. Ethics is gonna say, okay, we have a problem. We have limited resources and we only have $100 in the bank. Um, who are, are we going to spend it on and how much are we gonna to spend today? Because if we spend it all on one person today, we won't have any money to help anyone tomorrow. And as in the middle of the quarantine that we're going through, you can see people struggling with these issues already. It also, also, and this is really important, requires a transparent process, which is where we get all of our open meeting laws around the United States, where we require decisions to be made so that everybody knows what's going on. And in ethics, the process is as important as the outcome. And again, it's about trust and respect. It's how we make decisions and we take actions, not just sort of armchair, let's talk about these things theoretically. And then it's also about how we treat every single person every day, which comes to civility and manners in a library toward everyone, even if they're different from you, even if they don't like you, and even if they're not necessarily on their best behavior that day. The library as a whole decides who to kick out. The library as a whole decides what the protocols are for calling the cops. Um, the library as a whole does that. But that's not what we're focused on today. It's about our everyday treatment. Now, I want to be um, a little, I don't want to say academic, a little like teachery right now, because sometimes people think I've made up this stuff. <laughs> they think, oh, this is the Pat Wagner version of ethics. And I go, nah, that's not true. So what shaped our ethics? Uh, one interesting area in cognitive psychology says that there are regions of the brain that want us to be nice to other people, to collaborate, to trade, and that part of our survival of the species was being good to other people, being reasonable and polite because we realized our two villages would survive better if we got along. There's another part of our brain that's very much about us and them. And if you're not one of us, you're one of them and you're the enemy. So those two pieces of the brain are always working together and for, centuries before um, today's religions, societies that were not Christians and were not Jews were concerned about these issues and what they were. Um, obviously from different religious and spiritual traditions, but about 2000 years ago, Plato started talking about something called the rule of law, which we're gonna investigate in a minute. And then the Magna Carta came up at 1215 AD in England. And regardless of what culture you might come from in the United States, a lot of what shapes our ideas of ethics does come from Western civilization. That's just, you know, it is what it is. And the Magna Carta established county governments 
in England. And part of the reason for that is how do you protect the stranger who comes to the town? If they're not related to anyone, if they're not part of the, the tribe, the extended family, who looks after them? So this idea of safety for the stranger is sort of a sacred concept. And my dad, who worked for county government in Illinois and Wisconsin, used to talk about this. And he said, it's, it's very honorable. I get a little teary talking about the idea of part of what happens if you're working for local government, including a library, and I don't care if you're privately or publicly funded, this idea of safety for the stranger is something that I think is very honorable. We also have something called English common law, which is different from how a lot of countries in Western uh, society do things, but um, very much about um, the law bubbling up from the people rather than necessarily being opposed from the top down. And then we have that good old United States Bill of Rights. All of these things have come together to shape what we call library ethics. So a couple things again, and I mention these things because it's good to look it up on your own. So when people um, kind of attack what you're doing, you, you have some ways of saying, here, read this book, and then come back and tell me that I'm making this up. Uh, first of all, of course, that the interpretation of the First Amendment is that people have the legal right to express their ideas without government interference and that they get to read and listen to the ideas of other people, which is, I think, a really important part of library ethics. People get to read what they want to read. Um, the second part is that people say, well, what about this issue of privacy that we're going to talk about? Well, again, Look it up. The Supreme Court has decided that stated in a number of amendments, it implies that, yes, there is a constitutional right to privacy. Wow, that's like a big deal. That's a big deal. So I suggest people kind of look this up and learn a little bit about it. Now, what is this thing called the rule of law? It's got two simple ideas. The first idea, and this goes back to this idea of transparent process, that, and I love this line, this comes from a document from 19th century from Britain, that the law should be ordinary and accessible. What does that mean? Well, first of all, means that you write words that are easy for people to understand. You don't have a whole bunch of rules and regulations hidden away that people don't get to look at, don't get to, to understand. And we want to do it for the average American who may or may not even have a high school degree, but can read, they can read, and to be able to understand what's there. And the second part, that the process is transparent. I grew up in Chicago with smoke-filled political rooms. It still happens, you know? And the idea is that, as my dad would have said, when in doubt, tell the truth. Another thing is that let people look over your shoulder. Let people know what's going on. And as we'll talk some more, this has to do not just with how we treat external library customers, but how we treat staff and each other as well. There are exceptions, of course. There are legal exceptions. So there are privacy issues that have to do with um, personnel issues. There are privacy issues that have to do with financial issues. There's, there, there's rules in place. But again, it's not one person making the decision. The second part of the rule of law is there are no special privileges and no special class or group. And when the Magna Carta was written, it was about the church and the king. It was about royalty and those favors that the churches at the time had. So we're talking about the fact that it, it applies to people equally. And we're going to talk about the difference, one difference you might say about the difference between fair and equal, and why we might consider using those two terms differently. They, they kind of overlap. It's not that big a deal. But again, this has been around for hundreds of years. Easy to understand, transparent process, no special privileges, no special class or group. Okay. So, Three things I firmly believe about why understanding and practicing ethics is important to libraries. First of all, earning trust and respect. So when you have to go to the library, to your community for more money, when you're in the middle of a political tangle uh, regarding um, you know, a, a materials challenge of some kind or somebody doesn't like something happening at the library, you earn the trust and respect of people because they say, you know what, 
I felt treated fairly and equally when I went to the library, and they do their processes transparently. They obey Wisconsin law. I trust them in this. I trust them in this. Um, to be able to set standards for decisions so that we set priorities about what we do and we don't do. And it actually can increase productivity because people can make capable decisions faster. They know what they need to do, what the protocols are, and so on. We spend less time arguing with each other. And finally, that whole thing about unhealthy conflict, the kind of conflict that goes on for years where we're upset with each other, that the rules that we establish are respected because we had a process that people understood. For example, a few years ago, uh, when graphic novels were just coming in, our Denver Public Library here bought a whole bunch of Spanish language graphic novels. And at the time they bought them, Everyone was just learning a little bit about how to buy graphic novels and, and use them. And at the time, and I was told this by Rick Ashton, who was the city librarian at the time, 25% of people who lived in Denver County, their first language at home was Spanish. So large community to serve. Well, no one really took the time to vet every single novel and open up everyone. You know how it is. You know, you've got hundreds of items coming into a big library. And it turned out that some of the um, I'm trying to find a polite word. Some of the graphic novels were, let's just say, a tad racy, okay, if you get my drift, wink, wink. <laughs> and so some people found them, and there was a big uproar, a huge uproar. So first thing that Rick did was to thank people for the feedback. He personally sat down with the stack and went, oh, goodness, <laughs> yeah, this probably shouldn't be where they are, okay. But you know what? He was able to go back to the community and explain step by step. And they had him on radio shows with hostile uh, interviewers. And he kind of went step by step and explained, this is the process we use to uh, in collection development and acquisitions. These are the steps we take. And this is what we did. And under normal circumstances, I think we would have been fine. But this is what happened. We made a mistake and we fixed it. And you know what? Most people supported him because they had a healthy process in place that was transparent, written down, available for everyone to see, and um, the issue went away. The issue went away about stuff. And that's part of the reason I think that ethics are an important issue. So what we're going to take a look at, and this is going to be the heart of what we do today, is these four ethical standards. And we're going to talk about them in two different ways. We're going to talk about them in kind of a more abstract way, like big picture ways of how they work in a library. Then the second thing we're going to do is mention some ideas of how they apply specifically to working in a library. How do they apply specifically to frontline service in a library? So we'll have these. And the four ones are the four standards we're going to be talking about today. And remember, this is one of many, many different models many, many different models. First of all, the idea of transparency in governance, which means transparency in how decisions are made and actions are taken within the library. And transparency is an interesting issue because if you notice, transparency and privacy are kind of at odds with each other. Um, if you're someone who wants everything in black and white, ethics ain't for you. It can be very frustrating. Some people say, well, Pat, you have studied ethics for 20 years. Are you a better person? And I say, I don't know if I'm a better person, but I've learned to ask better questions. I've learned to be more humble about how complex life is. Uh, so I'm less certain. And when I talk to people who teach ethics, that seems to be a commonality. Yeah, you know, you do your best, you learn, you learn, you ask questions, you ask questions, and things don't become simpler. But you feel that you better are better at dealing with issues. And one lady at a library conference once asked me in front of a group, she said, what does ethics get you? <laughs> you know, like like it's a, a, a bubblegum machine and you put in money and you get out ethics. I don't know what she was thinking. And I said, you know what? If I use an ethical process, if I do research, if I talk and listen to stakeholders, by that time when I make a decision, even though I know I'm sometimes going to be wrong and sometimes get a whole bunch of people upset with me, you know what it does? It earns me a good night's sleep because 
I did my best. And my best means that studying ethics, you do better and better. At least I, I try to do that. So transparency in governance. We're going to talk about equal treatment and fair treatment. And this is something that's recent for me because of a lot of issues that come up having to do with equality and diversity, right? Um, and inclusiveness in society and in library standards. So I'm going to address that briefly. The whole idea of privacy for information users. And I'm going to say this more than once, that also means for staff and for staff reading books and so on. And then access to information for all. And what that means in the 21st century for a lot of different people. So first of all, we'll talk about transparency. But before we go on, I'm going to check in with Jamie and see, Jamie, do we have any questions that um, you'd like me to address right now? Transparency. OK, it starts with we have to look at our open meeting laws for our state. Every state is different. And people don't realize that the laws that apply to libraries in Wisconsin are different from the laws that apply to Minnesota or Iowa or Illinois. Just walk across the border, and there's different laws that the rules people are expected to follow are written and posted. That's why you don't want to have a lot of rules. <laughs> um, people should not have to pretend they're in the old Russia, where if somebody didn't like someone, they would just make up a rule. So we want to make it as easy as possible for people to know what the rules are and how to, quote, obey them. We want to make sure what we write does not use academic jargon. I. Um, my favorite piece of library jargon of all time was walking into a library here in Colorado, award-winning library, big, rich suburban community, and on a poster in front of the children's area, they said, what are you doing for phonological awareness for your children? My response was to burst into hysterical laughter. And I said, uh, don't you just mean to learn, for kids to learn like what the sounds of words are and to play word games and songs with them? Why are you putting up phonological awareness? Well, it's something we saw at a conference, right? I went home and talked to my husband, who's not just extremely good looking, but also wicked smart. And I asked him what he thought phonological awareness was. And he said, dang, if I know. And then he went back to work. So we have to be careful that within a few days of working for a library, you're no longer a civilian. You so much absorbed the jargon that we use in library land that the signs we put up are no longer for patrons, they're for people who are library people. And here's one of my big pet peeves, no secret services. I have walked into libraries where there was a holds policy available, but it was only for, quote, regular customers. Oh, yeah, I'll keep the books under the counter for you. When you come in, just ask for me. I'll get those bestsellers out to you right away. So. These are the basics of transparency. Now, what does it mean to? Again, are signs self-explanatory? I walked into one Illinois um, suburban library, prosperous, uh, right at the cutting edge, and they said, go to the um, go to the customer service desk if you need anything. And there was a big sign at the front. Well, then I went into the lobby, and none of the desks were labeled customer service desk. They had all these cute names like, oh, we have the concierge. Well, that's great, but does the average person who walks in knows that that's what you meant by customer service desk about things? How are first timers treated? Now, I said that, yes, I will tend to get better service walking in because I oftentimes look sort of like the person behind the desk. But I also walk into places where you can see that since nobody knows me and I'm a stranger, I get kind of the hooded look. I don't know. Maybe I look crazy or strange. I don't know about that. So sometimes when I'm talking to libraries and smaller communities, they said, we give everybody great customer service. And I say, how about the person who's never been to town before? It's one thing to say, oh, yes, we're all friends. We've known each other for 100 years. Now, I was working, and I'm going to mention the library, uh, visiting a library right at the um, Oregon-California border in Alturas, uh, California, um, big, big um, rural area, farming, ranching community, big valley. I walked into the library. 
They had no idea who I was. They treated me like a queen. Oh, hello, welcome to the library. I don't think we've seen you here before. Thank you so much for coming in. Is there anything I can do for you? And I said, wow, I don't know if I've gotten this kind of service in a long time. And they laughed, the staff was there. And they said, it's our director. Our director and her husband ran a hotel in the county for a long time and they had kind of a, a meeting hall where you know people would have receptions and weddings and so on and they made some money and what she did was retired from that job paid got herself an MLS and got the town to hire her as the director of the library and she runs the library the way she did her business and she came in and I asked her about it and she said yes that value of oh my goodness someone knew let's treat them well I don't get that experience every place I go again are the staff gatekeepers keeping secrets and here's an example of what do you do when there's a wrong law um, we had some glitches in our state library law here in Colorado for a long time and it was being worked on by a group of library and state political people to fix it. But in the meantime, what would happen is people would come into this library, and I heard this firsthand from the director, they'd come up against this problem, and the staff was taught to say, well, since you asked, here's the workaround. So this is what you do to get around the law until it's fixed. But people had to ask. So if somebody was pushy, competent, understood how libraries work, asked if there was something else, fine. People who didn't ask didn't get the same ability to use that secret workaround. The director who told me about this was very proud. We had an argument, we're friends, we sort of raised our voices at each other. And I said, you might think it's the right thing to do, but is it the ethical thing to do that there's a whole bunch of people who come in and never ask and don't get that secret thing? Are difficult people lied to? Uh, what I find, and it's happened more than once, that and difficult people, of course, is a euphemism for teenagers, that libraries will make up, people at the front line will make up policies to keep teenagers out of the library. I, and I'm not making this up. And of course, when we have discussions about this, um, the poor library director, usually all the blood drains out of their face and say, really, really, you're telling people this? Usually happens on weekends and evenings when bosses aren't around. Um, are, are secrets kept from personnel? Sometimes you're going through a very rocky road financially. And so many times I'm in that room and people are talking and it's the room with the leadership, right? The board and the leaders of the library and they're talking about what we can and can't tell people. And I said, you have to tell the truth as soon as possible to let people make decisions with their families of whether they want to stay or leave. And yes, there's some people who are going to panic and bolt, but it's worse for morale if you keep telling people things aren't fine are fine and then they find out later that you knew they weren't fine and they never told you and again our decisions made transparently we want to keep certain personnel issues private ethically and legally certain financial issues private um, again in terms of legal things and every place is different in how they do that but on the other hand I think most libraries the managers keep more secrets than they should and they don't keep these secrets uh, consistently. Some managers hoard information, particularly if you have a multi-branch library or you know, locations in a system about things. So these are some of the things that when someone come, like myself comes in, we start asking people. Then we have the thing of equal treatment. And remember, we're not talking about um, the fairness of equitability. What we're talking about is how me, Pat Wagner, behind a counter, treats you when you come in personally, regardless of who you are, what you look like, your socioeconomic status, you know, that should not matter, the color of your skin, your ethnicity, no. So no special treatment for buddies. And we'll just, that's my unofficial word for friends and families and so on. No special treatment for elites for the mayor or somebody who's important or self-important. Um, everybody has to be subjected to the same rules. They have to do the same thing, right? And if there are exceptions, there are exceptions because the library is a whole. Now I'm saying, of course, there's issues that come up. They're healthy. I mean, I'm not an idiot about how, how complex life can be, but 
we should talk about them as, oh my goodness, you know, we had this thing about people bringing in bags into the stacks and we didn't want to do that because we've had trouble with people shoplifting. But what if we have someone who has um, a disability of some kind and maybe their hands shake or something and the bag is going to help them carry the books from the shelves to the front? How do we deal with that in a way that's fair to, to folks and fair to them? and talk about that. And everyone receives civility and respect. A uh, dear, dear friend of mine had a stroke when she was 40 and uh, has spent the rest of her life in a wheelchair. And she told me that the only place she feels normal is Disneyland because Disneyland is set up to be proactive dealing with people who might have to use a cane or a wheelchair. They're all well-trained, the furniture, the ramps, everything is set up. And she said, I don't feel special in a bad way. I feel normal. And that's why, um, despite my law degree and my MBA and everything like that, my favorite place to go is Disneyland. Wouldn't that be nice if people in your community who had those sorts of physical challenges felt that way about how they're treated when they come into your library as well? Practical equality has a lot to do with the kind of training people get and how to be great, fantastic at customer service. The look on your face, the tone of your voice, it's interesting about how much time you spend. What if you're standing in line at the bank, you're not in a hurry, and people are spending five or ten minutes chatting about whatever in front of you, and then you come up and they're kind of abrupt. And that happens consistently. And trust me, if people are uh, people who might be uh, called parts of um, an outlier or marginalized group or a group that's very used to being treated not in a good way by the bulk of society, you got extra radar out, a little more sensitivity to those issues that are going on. And it's funny, people blow that off, say it's not a big deal <laughs> until it happens to them. Your posture and gestures, right? Um, the speed of the transaction, are you just trying to get rid of them? Or are you going to give them the same, same consideration as anyone else? And then your willingness to follow through. How are you? Did you find out what you wanted? And so on. Privacy. And the reason I have the flowers coming out of the wall is because I want to emphasize again, it's the person's choice about the privacy walls. If, for example, you had a, a privacy rule about not um, giving out what people were reading, but at the same time, you want to create some cool kind of uh, reader's advisory program so that I use your library and uh, people know what my favorite fiction books are, I would be happy in a flash to sign up with a service to let the universe, including the NSA and the North Korean government, know that I like classic murder mysteries, that I love Elizabeth George, and that um, I'm a fan of, of golden era science fiction and fantasy. And if that meant that the NSA knew that information, that's absolutely fine with me. But that should be something I can choose to opt into. So, Privacy, we get a little legalistic here, the protection of the circ and usage records so that your library has policies that everybody knows at the front line about responding to court orders and questioning subpoenas. You've got all that in place, but also physical privacy in libraries. If I go to my bank, my bank is standing in line. My bank has a, oh, about four or five foot space between where I'm standing in line and when I go up to the counter, and it's for the privacy of individuals having to do whatever it is they do. And uh, same thing has to do with computer com terminals, a lot of controversy about that. Privacy extends to staff as well, and we've had some unpleasant examples in recent years where academic and public and school librarians who, and staff, borrowing books and, and, and um, having that looked into, <laughs> if you might say, right? So we have to do that. Practical privacy, again, not broadcasting sensitive information, even little things like you owe 10 cents, right? Do what they do in a good hotel, write down the number handed to the person, rather than say, oh yeah, Pat, $5. I don't want people to know that. Procedures for dealing with the media. If you're in the middle of a controversy, what's the staff rules about talking to the media about things. Yes, this is America and there's freedom of, of speech, 
the downside of it is we often don't have the right information or the whole information and the media will manipulate you says this woman who has a journalism degree not commenting on custom materials the holds shelves my goodness um, state law and having it if they're not um, if it's not able to post them have them handy so that people understand what the rules are regarding privacy and again the question of how public or private are terminals concerning how people are, are looking at information and material access for all um, here's one I like are your hours for people who can get away nine to five uh, because even if they're working they can get away or are your hours for working class people who usually can't get away on those nine to five times what um, what are the bulk of the people who are you trying to reach what are your target audiences when do they need the library available are you a library that serves people who don't speak English are you a library who serves people who can't read and write through all the wonderful media things that you have to offer um, meaning information in different formats what are the kinds of services that you offer um, online for people and it's cheaper to do these these days so the excuse we don't have the money doesn't really fly with me depending on unless you're trying to do something hysterically complicated you can do these things and even cataloging um, I know there's a big bloody uh, conflict having to do with whether or not we start introducing bookstore categories into libraries and by the way it's not either or okay but cataloging in the 21st century of trying to get our patrons to memorize numbers I don't know if that's the best way for people to have access to information particularly if they don't want to talk to uh, a service person for some reason now Growing up in Chicago in the 1950s and 60s, we were required to know Dewey and know library science, and we got bibliographic instruction twice a week by radio from the Newberry Library. I mean, it was high tech in 1958, trust me, uh, pretty cool. So when I graduated from eighth grade, we had tests on cataloging and I had to memorize all the Caldecutts or Newberries up to that point and have a whole discussion. Okay, that's great, that's me. Most people don't have that kind of thing coming in. So is the average person today gonna walk into a library and feel welcome because the signs help them find on their own what it is that they need? Now there's some other parts too, and I have to say that this is stuff that the universe has taught me as I've grown older. How's the lighting in the stacks? If you have a bunch of people in your library who work for the library who are 25 or 30 years old, they're not going to maybe understand the issues of someone who's 60 or 70. The safety issues, looking at the ADA, and not the, um, how would you say, the mythological pros and cons of ADA, of the American Disabilities Act, but, but what it is today and how it might apply to your library. Uh, lots of good word out there about how making a library fine free has increased usage particularly among people who might not afford to work at the library and this is something interesting we went through this here in Denver it has to do with the paper alternatives to digital um, Denver County made a promise to the citizens that you could do business with any part of Denver County um, mostly uh, either by phone fax or email and it worked really well but what happened was suddenly a whole bunch of stuff people needed to get done wasn't available to them uh, because for some reason or another they didn't have a computer didn't have access to certain things so the so the city sort of took a step back and said we will do both we will have all the online digital stuff we will have a terrific phone service and I've used it and it is terrific and we'll also be able to mail things to your house for that 10 or 15 percent of people who may never be able to jump over the digital divide and have computers online and then again easy to use services of different ways so how does this also apply to how the library as a whole runs not just the front service desk okay so it not it's all starts with 
what happens in the library about, let's just call it taking ethical standards seriously, because it's not just about what happens in the front. And for the question that came up before, what happens when you have someone above you in the food chain who um, is not supporting it, this is where we start to address this, to be able to say, as a group, we're going to start talking about ethics. Um, the civility clause in job description came first from a library director who I worked with in Wisconsin, where she developed a, a civility clause, and yes, this was in a union library, unionized library, where she worked with the union, and basically it was like, this is what we promised to do in terms of treating each other better. And she had taken a job in a kind of contentious town with a difficult situation, and she said that after she had everyone sign the agreement with the support of the board and the union, people started coming up to her and saying, you know what, it's nicer to work here now. That there are clearly written expectations in terms of people's jobs, and ethics are included in that. That ethics becomes part of the training and the way you're evaluated. So people say, hey, the library is taking this seriously. That you have staff meetings regarding ethics. You have um, this program and other programs that are out there, there are tons of stuff about library ethics that you can access for free. Um, I think involvement in the state association is important because I find state associations more and more in libraries are paying attention to these issues and in the professional development collection. There's lots of books out there specifically about ethics in libraries that are available. Some other stuff is training on issues just like we just talked about, that whole difference between the difference between being fair and, and um, simply being equal, equal treatment versus fair treatment. I mean, there's great stuff up there. No special privileges for insiders. Ooh, this always gets me in trouble because people say, but don't I deserve? You know, uh, I know many libraries say, oh, if you're a library trustee, you don't have to pay fines. Well, that's okay. But if other people have to pay fines, then that's not really fair. Remember, um, we aren't going to allow royalty to have special privileges. Um, strict guidelines regarding nepotism and cronyism. Cronyism is about friends, nepotism about family. Uh, I have worked with libraries with great directors who have hired um, first degree relatives, right? Not third cousins but um, partners, uh, spouses, children, grandparents, parents, to work at the library. And in those cases, and I'm counting on my fingers now, six folks, in those six cases, every time the director has told me it's no problem at all because that relative of mine is subjected to the same rules as anyone else, and we're a small town, and it's not a big deal, Pat. And at every single time, the staff comes up to me privately and says, oh, Pat, it is a big deal, and this is why. Of course, we're going to treat this person differently. Of course, if they break a rule, we're not going to call them on it. Of course, if there's a big problem, we're not going to you know, go to the director of the board about it. So there seems to be like uh, kind of a split there. So I say, mm, err on the rule of no nepotism as you can. Yearly review of your state library law, which is a collection of laws that applies to libraries in your state, just to see if, oops, they've changed something. And once every year or two, the attorney who would represent your library in court might be a city or county attorney. I like them to review your policies. And we want them to do what we call a legal audit. Even some lawyers haven't heard of this. Because you don't want to have rules in place that can break the Arcane complexity of state and federal personnel rules, for example. The law is not rational. So you decide on some cool rule, and then you find out that it's against the law, and you get into a lot of trouble for that. Uh, so you don't want people saying, oh, gosh, I wish that this isn't your law, and you find out after there's been a mistake of some kind. So what's the agenda? What's your first steps you can take? So think about this as we come to our conclusion, what are two things that you could do in the next week 
based on the material that we covered. And it was fun doing this because this often is a one day workshop so you can understand <laughs> that it was fun kind of pick and choose and what I was going to, to do. But think about what are two things you could reasonably do in the next week. Now again, we're online here mostly in the United States. So most of you aren't there at your library, but what is something you can do? And let's take a look at what you've written down and let's see about comparing it maybe to some of the ideas that we have listed here. First of all, share this information with others. Uh, this program, as I understand, is recorded, will be recorded. It's something that you can review with people online. You can share it, talk about this. I think this is really important. Um, what do you agree with? What, what don't you agree with? I think that's important. Where are the problems? How do these ideas of library ethics conflict with something that you believe that you think is important? Maybe play a little mind thought game, my husband would call them, uh, to write down what your four standards would be. Your standards, the things that are most important to you in terms of library ethics might be different from mine, might be different from other people. So you can start thinking about these and thinking about if you use these four standards as a starting place, what might have to change? Might, what might you want to question? You know, what might you want to take more seriously? It might be a time, because everyone has so much time on their hands. I'm sorry, I'm busier now <laughs> than I've ever been. Um, we work from home, but working with the quarantine is a whole different issue. Um, reviewing policies for consistency. What's the wording of the policies? Um, are they written in everyday language? Are they written for the internal audience? Or are they written for the person coming in um, for the first time who wants to understand what's going on in the library? Um, one thing that we did that really helped us on this issue was we, we created an avatar. We created a person. And so the person who we try to do our work for is a woman named Madge who's in rural Nebraska, lives on the family farm, and also is the library director for the small town she's in. She has a high school degree. She's wicked smart, will never have the money. Uh, time to go to finish her college degree or get an MLS, goes to all the training she can do. She needs for this to be understandable for her. So who's your avatar? Start looking at the bigger picture. Start seeing about how actions we do today that feel expedient are going to have maybe not so good um, impact down the line and kind of start learning from other professional ethical codes. Uh, specialties like the medical librarians, the law librarians, they have their own codes of ethics affected by the larger professions. Academics, um, lots of different people have code of ethics. If you just type in ethical codes, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff pop up. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Jamie and see if we have time for any other questions that might have come in.